Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are going back to basics now to talk about the hand. Uh, the hand is an exquisite uh, tool for uh, um, to uh, elaborate the world, and the, we, we talk about the sensational hand and the plastic brain. And I'm going to talk about the, the importance of hands and the interaction between the hand and the brain, and how we can use that. The hands come very handy in a lot of situations in life. They give us strength, we communicate with them, uh, we get and give information, and they have a large extent of precision. And look at this guy. He has done a lot of piano playing. This is the beautiful uh, right hand of Keith Jarrett. And look at his lovely muscle connected to his uh, right little finger. Look at your own hands for a second. And look at your neighbor's hands for a second. They, they are very different. And hands are very much a part of our identity. Hands are a very expressive tool with gestures and uh, um, a very powerful communicative tool. This would be very difficult to do with an app. And of course it is an artistic tool. And thinkers a long time back have talked about the hand as the outer brain and the hand as an extension of the brain. And that is an expression of the very close interaction between the hand and the brain. An exquisite tool for communication. And also a long time back, hands uh, have been symbols for a lot of things. This is uh, hand prints from uh, Patagonia in South America, and there are similar hand prints in, uh, in southern Europe, and also in Tarnumshede in Bohuslän in Sweden, we have beautiful hand prints on stone. So if we look at the hand, we, it, it has been a lot of talk about history during these days. Uh, and if we look at the hand in a long perspective, uh, Roughly two, three million years back, when they found Lucy, actually the hand was ready at that time, looked at that time almost as it does today. But the brain was uh, only rudimentary, very small. So there is a discussion what came first, the hand or the brain. I don't know, but definitely it could be that when we started to walk on two legs, settle down, uh, carry home things, and uh, started to cook and to use tools. Maybe at that time, that, that was a drive for um, brain development and uh, development of uh, the size of the brain. But of course, there are a lot of physiological prerequisites for hand function. There must be, we have roughly 30 bones only in the hand. We have a lot of muscles inside the hand tendons in the hand connected to muscles far away from the hand. There are ligaments and vessels and nerves and a lot of things that have to function for this uh, tool to wor work so nicely as it does. But what is, what is very special with the hand is the skin. Uh, the psychologists, they have written kilometers about perception and about uh, haptics, as they call this functional sensibility. Uh, they say that the, uh, functional sensibility is the skin in concert with muscles and joints. And, and what is so very special is that the hand can perceive, it can execute, and it can express in exactly the same second. It's the speed of lightning. And that is what's, what makes this situation possible. And this is because of the fantastic sensibility of the hand. Sensibility is, is the largest sense organ, actually, in the body. At, uh, I mean, vision is huge. We have uh, lots of more neurons in the brain for vision, but, but uh, uh, the body costume, the, the skin, is the largest sense organ. A couple of square meters and, and four kilo, roughly. 
Uh, and sometimes we say that a hand without sensibility is blind, because if you have ever so fine muscles and joints in your hand, but you don't have sensibility, you can't use your hand very much. Uh, and this guy, Josipovic, I think he's called, he's, he's written a book uh, called Touch, where he says that seeing is believing, but touching is understanding. We, we, we see a lot of things, but we want to touch them, to really get an um, uh, information about the, the, the quality of the fabric or so. Uh, and uh, it is reflected also in our language, the importance of, uh, of sensibility and of touch. We say, let's stay in touch. This was a touching story, a touching movie. And uh, I give you free hands to do whatever you like. And uh, we have handbooks, we have manuals, uh, and uh, something that is handmade, that is a uh, sort of a reflection of uh, good quality. And uh, uh, think about a handwritten letter. That is magic. You hold the same pa paper as the person who wrote the paper hold a couple of days back. How many of you uh, wrote a handwritten letter last week? Last month? Last year? Oh, not, not too bad. If you want to read more about these stories about the hand, we have this book, Handen och Hjärnan, from uh, Hand and the Brain, from Lucy's Thumb to the Thought Controlled Robotic Hand. Uh, it is available in Swedish since a couple of years. It's written by Johan Lundboy, who is um, a professor at uh, the Department of Hand Surgery in Malmö since many years. And it will come in English later this year in Springer Verlag. Uh, the sensory and motor functions uh, rely very much on the integrity, of course, of the structures, the peripheral structures in the hand, as I mentioned. But what is very important is their cortical projections. The skin, the very long nerve cells, the longest cells that we have in our body, a couple of meters, the ones that go all the way to the foot. And then there is a reflection in the brain of what's happening in the periphery. And that is an, an ongoing um, intertalk in both directions. But it's, it's also important to remember why do we have sensibility? Of course, it is for protection. Uh, and we talk of different kinds of touch. I know that Petra later today will talk about industrial design, and of course then it's uh, important to think of different kinds of touch. We talk of, again, sorry, I was too quick. Um, uh, a psychologist, Katz, have um, described these uh, different kinds of touch. Shape, different textures. Uh, and then something called immersed touch, when we touch water or the wind against your skin, or when you put your finger in the flower pot to see if it needs water or not. That is a mix of different, uh, probably temperature sense, in combination with the uh, sense of different textures. And then there is volume touch, when you palpate a structure or when you, when you feel your pulse. This person is very important when we talk about the interaction between the body and the brain. Uh, it's an homunculus. He was demonstrated in the late 30s by a Canadian neurosurgeon. Uh, and he mapped the body in the brain. Here is the sensory area in the brain and here is the motor area in the brain. And you can see the, the hand and the face are very close on the brain surface. And it is so that the size of the representational area of the brain for a body part depends on how much we use it. So of course, the face and the hands are the part of the body that we expose most to the world. So they are largest in the brain. But it can change quickly. He's, this is a very dynamic little person. 
Uh, and this is just to illustrate that it is not very strange that the hand and the face are close together in the brain, because things we do with the hand and the brain, the hand and the face are often connected. We already have talked about plasticity today, and uh, plasticity is important. It's an, an billions of nerve cells that is in constant or ongoing crosstalk in the brain. And the word plasticity means the capability of being molded. Uh, I don't know, it was Fabian or your colleague that mentioned brain elasticity the other day. That's, that's a, also a very good word to describe brain plasticity, brain elasticity. We talk about activity-related plasticity. Uh, increased or decreased activity gives a changed activation of the brain. So if we are in plaster for six weeks, the area of the hand goes down and vice versa. So it's a matter of using it or losing it. And then there are different kinds of plasticity. We talked earlier about how, how plastic the, the children's brains are. And, and of course, uh, they can easily reorganize. Well, this is our brains, uh, slightly more rigid, uh, but not impossible. We heard on the, the previous session that it's, uh, it's not Im uh, impossible at all for uh, adults over 40 to learn to play the guitar, and it is possible. It just takes a little more time. There are lots of evidence in the last 15, 20 years that, that show this. There's also a lot of uh, uh, collaboration between the different uh, senses uh, that is represented in the brain, that all senses work together to experience the world with a little help of the angels, like this, this uh, UK thinker already in the 1600s showed us so lovely in this picture. And, and this is uh, known, of course, by blind and deaf people since long. Uh, and we have a very nice uh, uh, technique today to illustrate what's happening in the brain when we stimulate, for example, the hand and the different fingers, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and now just uh, a few words about um, illusions of hand function, when we don't have hand function. Uh, using this capacity to, uh, to uh, um, use one sense in, in, another, uh, in another capacity, uh, we ha in, in our lab we have um, this sensor glove system. We have little microphones on a glove and all textures sound very different. If you touch your sweater and you touch your skin, you, and if you really listen, it is a different sound. And if we transpose that sound to earphones, a patient without sensibility can very easily learn to, um, learn to identify different textures, and that can be very useful in rehabilitation. Another way to create an um, uh, illusion is to use a mirror box. This is a little black box. Let's say this person has lost her left arm and has uh, severe phantom pain in the hand that she hasn't got anymore. This is what she sees from the other side. It's a mirror on the box. And in the mirror, she can see a uh, reflection of her right hand that looks like the left hand that she hasn't got anymore. And she can move it, and it is not, it's, it's not painful anymore. Used a lot in rehabilitation today, and introduced uh, by uh, an um, uh, American neurologist in California, Dr. Ramachandran, in the mid-90s. You can also just think about activity, and the right area in the brain is uh, activated. Uh, Henrik Ersson at Karolinska Institutet in Stockholm and his co-workers have uh, demonstrated this, just to imagine hand, foot or tongue movements. And there is activity in the right area in the brain. And who can resist this? Please.
feel free if you like. It's very easy to just, just if you just think about it. Uh, and uh, it's the mirror neurons in the forebrain that uh, starts working. It was an Italian researcher, Dr. Rizzolatti, that came, came up with this, uh, uh, I don't remember the year now, now it's in the early 2001. It was by accident actually that he found out about the mirror neurons. It is motor cortical areas that are activated just by observation. And this has been found to be important in learning in understanding of uh, other people's body language and also in empathy. And what's even more interesting when we talk about uh, rehabilitation, about the mirror neurons, if you just look at someone grasping a cup, it is low activation of the mirror neurons. But if you look at the cup in an interesting context, that is a positive context for you, then, then it's higher activation of the mirror neurons. And then finally, about to lose a hand. We have a lot of fancy prosthesis in the world today, uh, but unfortunately, the, the loop is between the tip, the fingertip of the prosthesis and the motor in the prosthesis. There is no real feedback that goes up to the brain of the person. So that is what we are aiming at, to use the map in the brain of each finger. And almost all amputees have, after the amputation, they have the same map, but on the stump instead of the hand. So we use that in, in a very simple context with the, uh, with the air system, with little air bulbs on the fingertips of the prosthesis. So when you press here, you activate the hand map on the stump. And the patient can get a real sensibility, an intuitive man-machine interface that can enhance the body ownership in the prosthesis. And there are a few, um, a few examples of this uh, prosthesis. And the last picture is uh, showing a, a person that has been using this prosthesis for a while, a prototype, and he says that after almost 30 years with the prosthesis without sensibility, I put this on and get feedback and touch things and it just works. So thank you very much. <laughs>